thoracoabdominal emergencies. I like to color code things by organ. You can see this is how we will break this down. The first group are thoracic emergencies, the next group intestinal emergencies, and lastly, viscous and vessel emergencies. I'm, if you've seen my presentations before, they're usually just straight case presentation, but I thought some additional information about the pathologies we'll be viewing would be helpful for people so you'll see I have the a typical age range and gender distribution, pink for female, blue for male, white for equal in both genders, right? We will do the annual incidence of each of these pathologies per 100,000, that's in green on the second line. I will present icons representing the risk factors in red, the percentage mortality, uh, for that entity. And then last, the CT sensitivity. All of these stats were taken from the uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information. Okay, Bud-Chiari syndrome, more common in women between 20 and 40. Very low incidence. This is on the order of one in a million. The risk factors are oral contraceptives, pregnancy, and polycythemia. A mortality of 10%, and a CT sensitivity, I think this is the lowest number we have, of only 50%. I was pretty surprised to see that. I suppose it must be related to contrast phase, because that can be a big determinant in how apparent this is. So the first finding here is just the heterogeneity of the uh, hepatic parenchyma. You have to look closely, but it is definitely there. It uh, has sort of a just a perfusion heterogeneity is how to put it. The IVC and the hepatic veins are not filling, and you'll see uh, that this is in a contrast phase where you would in fact expect it. Actually, just on this cut, you can tell that because you've got azagous vein filling here. And for the azagous vein to be filling and the IVC not filling, uh, there's got to be a problem. Lower down, you can see there again the heterogeneity of the hepatic parenchyma. Gallbladder wall thickening, of course, you guys are so honed for your upcoming boards that I'm sure you know that gallbladder wall thickening is on the differential, uh, or sorry, Bud Chiari is on the list of things causing uh, gallbladder wall thickening, but here's a nice example that is in fact true. And you can see now that IVC is filling on that lower cut, telling you that this cut is definitely pathologic, that there's no IVC or hepatic venous uh, filling, and now you can see that the IVC, in fact, over a pretty long segment was occluded. Hard to say down here whether that's clotted or not, but I suspect it probably is because, again, we've got azagous filling so high up in the abdomen. So note again the heterogeneity of the hepatic parenchyma. It looks almost like a, a early macronodular cirrhosis is developing. And there again is that IVC. So this is the acute version of Bud Chiari. Of course, there's a chronic one too, uh, where you'll see more pronounced uh, caudate lobe enlargement. All right, our next case is a portal venous thrombosis, more common in men, 50 to 65. Incidence is low, thankfully, about three per 100,000. The risk factors are cirrhosis, cancer, polycythemia, and infection. And that's actually what we've got here. So there's a 15% mortality and a very high sensitivity of CT uh, for portal venous thrombosis, 98%. So here, uh, I really wanted everyone to see this one because it's such a fooler. These tiny little abscesses amidst large regions of hypodensity. Uh, these are bacterial abscesses. When you see these tiny little things, you start thinking of coxy or crypto or uh, just your more unusual infections. And I always found it uh, easy to forget that bacterial abscesses just look like this when you catch them at the right time. A whole collection of little tiny uh, abscesses first form. They, they probably later become confluent if left to their own devices. But don't let this fool you. It's not a crazy infection. It's oftentimes just straightforward bacterial infection. Now, you can also see here 
a very nice portal venous filling defect. It's so large, it actually uh, is hard to spot. You even wonder if it's part of the vein, but I can assure you it is, and you, can, you will see on the movie, uh, this portal venous thrombosis is running out into all lobes of the liver. Here ultimately was the source. There's colonic wall thickening and some diverticulosis, and this was just infectious diverticulitis. Uh, that went untended and uh, developed portal venous thrombosis. I honestly, I think that's why males uh, get this more commonly is because they'll go longer with obvious ill symptoms uh, without seeking medical attention. And the cases I've seen of this clinically have all been instances like that. If you just uh, get into the hospital when you're clearly ill <laughs> and get treated appropriately, things won't come to this, uh, to this point. So note again that all that portal venous thrombosis and those collections of little tiny fluid uh, pockets that will later become confluent. But again, don't be fooled. That doesn't mean it's something weird like coxy or crypto. It's This one was just straightforward E. coli bacterial abscesses. On the coronal, you can really appreciate the venous thrombosis. You can track basically portal vein thrombosis into just about every segment of the liver. So very extensive. All right, that is a case of hepatic abscesses with portal venous thrombosis. Our next case is emphysematous pancreatitis. This is more common in men, 50 to 70. The incidence is thankfully low, about two to three percent per, or sorry, two to three per 100,000. The risk factors are alcohol, diabetes, previous surgery, and gallstones. And the mortality is a striking 33%. I don't think that surprises anybody, but a pretty high number. The CT is considered to be 100% sensitive. I don't know if it's quite there, but yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty easy to identify pancreatic gas collections that are uh, indicative of this. This case for me goes way, way back. It was very early in my teleradiology career. I always remember this patient was in Hawaii vacationing. And so you can see the, the gas and the fluid surrounding the pancreas. There's even a little focus of gas there within the superior mesenteric vein, right at its confluence with the splenic vein. And there it is again in the SMV. You can see the heterogene heterogeneous hypodensity of the pancreatic head there as well, along with additional gas collections. And lastly, we go all the way down here, more gas and stranding. And there is the ill-defined density sitting right at the ampulla. That is the gallstone that's causing it all. And you'll see on the movie that the uh, common bile duct was dilated right down to that. Uh, this patient was unfortunately on the uh, sort of unpopulated side of Maui out at Hana where there are no facilities and they could not find an endoscopist. They didn't have an endoscopist anywhere near and uh, she was just so far from uh, the modern hospitals of uh, uh, Western Maui, I believe it was, uh, that they just couldn't save her. So you can see that study's dated 2005. That was my uh, first year as a teleradiologist. So you can see all those gas collections, a lot of stranding, a lot of indistinctness of the pancreatic parenchyma, a lot of hypodensity, especially in the region of the head. And note again that SMV gas, which cannot be a good sign. So that's a case of emphysematous pancreatitis. Next, hemorrhagic pancreatitis. Now, data for hemorrhagic pancreatitis as an entity unto itself did not uh, exist. So I've got pancreatitis data up here. Uh, 40 to 60 for women, 50 to 70 for men. Women tend to be associated with gallstones, while men slightly more frequently are associated with alcohol. And that's uh, why the different age ranges as well. 20 per 100,000, so pancreatitis, actually fairly common compared to some of the things we're looking at. Alcohol and gallstones, of course, are the most common risk factors. The mortality is about 15%, which doesn't surprise me 
in fact, I might have guessed it was higher. Uh, pancreatitis just haunted me uh, as a medicine resident. I think I was more scared of this entity than just about anything else out there. CT scan for straight up pancreatitis is only about 75% sensitive. Uh, you certainly can miss it. You can have a normal CT for that matter and still have pancreatitis. So this is interesting. This is a really phlegmonous pancreatitis that has these hypodense masses eroding into a variety of adjacent structures. So you can see there is actually a phlegmonous mass eroding into the region of the gastric fundus, and it has eroded a gastric vessel there, causing active extravasation. That, in turn, is bleeding down into the body of the pancreas. You can see the entire pancreas is enlarged and hypodense. And there is a little blush of uh, extravasated contrast in it in the body right there, and we'll see that better on the movie. And when I'm describing these phlegmonous masses, you can see this one in the splenic hilum right, is eroding right in there, and you can tell that the next focus of hemorrhage is going to be coming from that left upper quadrant. All right, so here's the phlegmonous mass eroding the stomach, and you'll now, follow that extravasation. Look at that. It bleeds right down into the substance of the pancreas. And then there is that splenic hilar phlegmon uh, clearly about to erode other vessels. So there again, that's a phlegmonous mass extending up from the pancreatic tail, basically, or body, right, with actual extravasation into the substance of the pancreas. So an unusual case of hemorrhagic pancreatitis there. Wow. All right, on to our next. This is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. I tried to get more common things, but this case was so good uh, that I decided ultimately to include it. This is most common in men between 50 and 70, and I'll, I'll just admit, I still call this Wagoners. I look at that and I still call it Wagoners. Uh, the incidence is a fortunate low eight per million. It's pretty uncommon disease. Interestingly, too, no risk factors have been identified for this. They just don't know uh, what causes this. There isn't a genetic or hereditary or environmental association that anyone has been able to determine. The mortality is about 10%, even treated, and the sensitivity of CT is about 88%. And that's usually for secondary complications uh, of the polyangiitis. So first, there are these tiny contrast collections in both the liver and the kidneys that represent small aneurysms. And there is a hypodense fluid collection adjacent to the kidney, along with a lot of stranding, and that is consistent with hemorrhage. But here in the kidneys, you can see those tiny contrast collections that represent small aneurysms. And here on the posterior aspect of the left kidney, you can see it displacing the left kidney. And you can see a layering density uh, consistent with a hemorrhage. So here are all those little liver aneurysms. You can see they're more than I marked. There is that big perinephric hematoma. And the little aneurysms all throughout the kidneys. Again, there are more here in the liver. Right? And then there's that big hemorrhage in the left kidney. And then more renal aneurysms. So renal aneurysms uh, certainly can be associated with other things, IVDU, other uh, vasculitides. And the liver is a little bit unusual, but this is the thing that seals the deal. There's a little cavitary lesion there in the lowest portion of the visualized lung right there seals the deal. You've got a cavitary lesion and evidence of angiitis, uh, so that's going to be a case of Wegener's.